Right scale, and uh, today we're talking about cloud spend, managing your cloud spend. So what I want this to be actually is more about the tools, and I want to walk through those tools and show you how you can actually do monitoring, forecasting, and kind of some optimization techniques as well. I want to touch into those. And if you guys have any questions at any one point or towards the end, I guess we'll pass around the mic and you can um, ask any questions. Um, Ronnie is also going to be presenting with me. So Ronnie is also a product manager at Rightscale. And he looks after the enterprise reporting section and all the kind of reporting and monitoring. So he'll get up and show you those tools as well. Cool, so let's, uh, let's jump in. So quickly want to touch up on um, the changes to the cloud, the kind of mind shift. Hi, come on in. Um, the changes to the cloud, the mind shift. And I want to go through, we only have one hour session today. So I just want to go through three of the phases of cost management. So one is the investigation and planning phase. Two is the deploying and monitoring. And three is the optimization. Now, there's other advanced, more advanced steps, um, but we won't have time to get into it today. So um, I'll leave my business card around as well. If any of you got any questions afterwards, uh, just come up to me and uh, ask away. I also want to state that everything I show in this report, so all the tools that we actually use in here, we use ourselves at RightScale. So we're in actually a unique position because RightScale is used to manage RightScale itself. There's something called Meta, which is a pretty cool configuration setup. Um, all the kind of forecast, cost forecasting we do in here, all the cost monitoring we do in here, we use internally at RightScale. And so when we have that problem scenario ourselves, we can actually get a really good solution in place. And you'll see it when I, uh, when I come up to it. OK, so first up, the cloud mind shift. And what I mean by that is the, the change from upfront, someone coming to um, you know, IT and saying, I need to buy some stuff. And they're going to say, OK, let's go through budgeting. I need a million bucks right up front to buy a couple of servers. I need to plan it. I need to get my staff to come in, install it, do all that kind of stuff. One thing that's happened is that change from, I mean, you've heard it before, that change from the up, you paying a lot up front setting up your infrastructure and then getting to use it over time to the hourly cost of provisioning instances whenever you want and getting those up and running. That mind shift is actually causing some issues. Why? Because it used to be that I would pay upfront, I know exactly how much I'm going to pay, and I know, I know exactly what I'm going to get in return. The ongoing is much more confusing because I don't know, if I go to my CFO, I don't know how much it's going to cost. So I'm going to say, well, it's an ongoing cost. So it's going to keep going and going. It's not just investment right now. And at the same time, combined with that, it's going to change over time. And that's the confusion. It's going to keep going, and it's going to change over time. I mean, this isn't, this isn't something new, right? Um, the kind of old um, way of heavy machinery as well. There's been lots of other. Um, industries that you would, instead of paying to purchase heavy machinery, you would rent it. The only difference being that cloud prices, as you heard Michael talk this morning as well, are so much more complicated. And so I want to give a simple example of one of those. So that mind shift, I guess, is causing a lot of confusion. That confusion is causing a lot of people to slip up on their costs. I mean, it's, it makes sense, right? If you've got 12,000 price points to kind of look through, and if you don't know about them, you're just going to get hit with a bill, and then you're going to say, oh, OK, so I need to look at that as well. And that might be a hefty kind of you know, um, payment that you need to make. And you know, we, we're not getting really a lot of help from the cloud providers because their costs are being more and more complicated. Now, they have reasons for that as well. Obviously, it makes sense for them to set their business up in a way to make money as well. But I'll show you an example of how complicated something like this can be. So let's say I want a server. Just a basic server, that's all I need. Great, OK, so let's uh, start drawing out the dimensions of what we need to consider. One, cloud provider. Which cloud provider do I want to use? AWS, Google, Rackspace, I mean, all the partners we've got here as well. Everyone's got a different offering. So we've got to choose one of those guys. After that, we're going to choose a cloud or a region. US East, US West, UK, Europe, all these kind of things. 
So, and each one of these that I'm going to state actually here is going to have a different cost point. So, we're trying to build up that big matrix of where these kind of costs are coming from. So, okay, I've chosen my cloud provider. I'm good. I've chosen my cloud. What do I want next? Well, I need a server type. Medium, large, X large, um, the kind of CPU power I need, the memory I need, that kind of what do I need from the server type for the application. On top of that, I have operating system. Do I want a Windows, Linux, and there's more than just Windows and Linux, there's different SUSE Enterprise Linux and all these different kind of SQL web server, different formats that they come in, and each one of those will have a different price point as well. Great, so I've got my uh, server ready. Next one is how do I want to buy this thing? How do I actually want to pay to use the thing that I've just selected? And so we would think, okay, there's a couple of options, but no, there's a, actually a good few couple. There's on demand first up, and that is you basically enter a credit card and you pay per hour for as much as you want to use. Then we have reserved instances. We have the one year from AWS, we have one year and three year reserved instances. Azure also has six month and 12 month um, res reservations. And these are um, money saving tips that you can do. So they'll expect an upfront payment and they'll reduce the monthly payments. And I'll actually step through one of these examples later on. On top of that, there's another complexity which says, um, AWS says, do you want to use light, medium, or heavy reservations? Depending on how much you use an instance, you have to choose either if this thing is going to run 24 hours a day, it's kind of heavy utilized. Is it light? Is it just going to be a couple of hours per day, a couple of hours per month maybe? Or medium, somewhere in between. And there's also spot instances as well. Now, we've chosen a server and we've chosen how we want to pay for it. Next up is the currency. We actually have different cloud providers will charge differently based on where they are operating out of, right? So Rackspace UK will charge in Great British Pounds. Um, Rackspace USA is US dollars. So all these different clouds could be charged in different currencies. That's all we needed. So we've now chosen um, a server. At least we want to run a server and we're good to go. Nope, prices just changed. So over the last 14 months, we actually would step through this um, for, a, for a blog post kind of we wrote, is over the last 14 months, there's been 29 different price changes. And these are ranging from compute, databases, storage, all these things. Um, if you go to blog.rightscale.com, you can see the whole, whole blog and the, it provides and these changes were happening. It's really quite cool actually. So that's the confusion um, that's coming from it, and that's how it's going to be really complex. So I got this question asked for me one time, actually, when I demoed Plan for Cloud, and I'll show you guys that as well. Someone said, well, how complicated can it actually be? And that's where kind of we used, um, Michael came up with this price points as well. In our database, in Plan for Cloud, we have 12,000 price points. These are 12,000 things that the different cloud providers can charge you for, and if you, hit, if you don't know about them, right, you're going to hit them and you're going to be charged at them. And that's why we needed to build an actual simulation engine, not just a really simple calculator. Um, so that was the introduction. I guess the differences. Let's get in and get into our first step, which is investigation and planning. So we're thinking about a proof of concept project. We're thinking architecting the application. So we're thinking, OK, this application requires these may, this many servers, this, many, this much storage, how it's going to communicate with different components of the, um, of the architecture. We're thinking about workloads. We're thinking, is it a constant running application that requires three servers and that's it? It's going to run 24 hours a day continuously? Or is it something that's going to change over time, up and down, the different kind of temporary usage patterns that we need to think about? And then we need to think about which At this point, as I said, I'd love to jump in and actually show you the tools to help you guys actually do this stuff. Um, so the first thing I want to do is if you go to planforcloud.com and up here, there's a link called cloud providers. If you click on that, to make it simple for beginners of the cloud to get in, introduced into what there is offering on the cloud, we've created this big matrix of the different offerings from the six major cloud providers that we currently support. 
These range from, so we've got the compute, databases, block storage, object storage, um, support levels. That's just that top graph, that top table is giving you an overview of the different resources available. Then you can drill down into each one and see the specifics. So compute services, what operating systems are, um, are supported, low specs, high specs. And this is really cool because it gets a lot of people talking about the resources available. And you can start to kind of feel your way around what the different club, cloud providers are offering in terms of resources. Block storage, object storage, and also support levels. So what, what tiers of support different cloud providers provide, what they come with, response times, things like that. So that's the first resource I would say if you're in the first steps is planforcloud.com and the cloud providers link right to the top. There is also some kind of, um, you know, it's not, we're, we're, we're the first to admit this cost is not the only factor. There's other, there's cost to performance ratio, feature sets, things like that. So there are currently um, some tools available to assess performance of the cloud. Things like Cloud Harmony, those guys run benchmarks um, on different cloud providers and tell you, kind of give you a rough estimate of the performance. However, note that when I launch a server on the cloud, I could, it could be launched here on different hardware, and if I terminate this instance, this instance and run it again, it could be completely different hardware. So that kind of performance is going to be dependent on your application. We actually had a customer of ours do a really, really cool thing in which they launched an instance, ran their own performance benchmarks. If that instance was up to the scratch, they would keep it. If not, they would actually shut it down launch another one, run the performance again, so they get to the ones that they are kind of, they're comfortable using. However, um, if this is your proof, um, you know, proof of concept project at this stage, performance might not be that big of a deal for you right now. I mean, a lot of people are just, um, would go launch an instance, launch their applications and say, let's assess the performance, let's see what we get out of these things. Um, and now the main one, so, Cloud provider prices, the costs. So what um, Michael talked about this morning and what tools are available to assess your costs. This is Plan for Cloud. Um, I'm actually the founder of Plan for Cloud. Um, so we launched Plan for Cloud in January 2012, um, acquired by RightScale. So we're now part of RightScale. And we have a team dedicated in Scotland, in Edinburgh. Um, the accent doesn't come through, I know. And what happens is, we are concentrating on Plan for Cloud. What Plan for Cloud is, as I said before, is a massive simulation engine. You're going to, I'm going to step you through it. We're going to design the infrastructure that we require. We're going to run that through a simulation with the latest cloud provider prices and create a detailed report of how much this scenario is going to cost us. So from this page, um, planforcloud.com, you can log, um, create a free account or we've even made it even simpler, you can just log in as a guest. Um, if you log in as a guest, you won't be reminded of price changes that affect your deployments and things like that. So I would encourage you to um, sign up. Once you sign up and jump in, you'll get to the dashboard. Here, we show you all the different scenarios or deployments that you could make. Now, one thing to note is I've just come in from the site to the tool. I haven't put in any credit card information. I haven't put any cloud credentials essentially. So what I'm doing, I'm just, just playing around with the different options that are available. Let's open a, kind of a sample three-tier web app and see this is the design page. So this is where we are describing what servers we need right at the top, what storage units we need, databases, data transfers, support plans, and other costs. And it's really simple to use. So let's say I want a server. I'm going to click Add Server. And I'm going to be presented with a list of options that I have available. Let's say I already know that I want to use Google. So I'm going to tick on Google. I have my options. I also have filters based on if I want to browse through all the different cloud providers. I can filter based on CPU and RAM. So this is us just going through selecting our resources. So let's say, let's create a T1 micro um, AWS instance. We can give it a name. So let's call this one base. 
the operating system that we want this to run on, which cloud we need this um, to run on. Again, we can, there's different prices for each one of these, so I'll show you how to, you can clone these um, entire deployments and change features, aspects of them to assess the cost on different clouds. So let's say you want US East, um, how we want to buy them, we'll come back to this in a bit, and how many of these do I need? I just need one for now, I can say I want 100, whatever. And what's my usage? Is, it gonna, is this thing, I'm imagining this thing gonna run 24 hours a day? Is it 12 hours a day, nine to five? What's the usage of these instances? Really simple, and I'm gonna click Add Server. There we go, that's our base server added right up top. There it is. Um, we can do the exact same thing with storage. One thing to note is, with, as with RightScale, we are um, multi-cloud. So these deployments can be made up of multiple cloud provider resources. So as you can see, I've got hosting www site on Google US. I'm taking database backups on US, um, AWS US West. So I can design multiple cloud providers in here. Databases, again. And at this point, I want to show you something really cool, which is the addition of usage patterns. I have, in this, in this scenario, I have a DR database, and my, actually let's go for the main database. I've got the main database, and it's gonna start at 300 gigabytes of storage in this database. However, I'm, as my business is growing, as I'm changing my resource consumption, I'm gonna click create a pattern. I'm gonna have more and more people come onto, the, come onto my tools, my software, and start consuming more and more. So I'm gonna start with 300 gigabytes, but I'm actually gonna add 10 gigabytes onto that every month. And that's a permanent pattern. Let me quickly open up the tutorial page. Um, there's two different types of patterns. These, there's the permanent pattern, in which I'm always gonna increase my consumption. If that be storage, um, that be backups, things like that. There's also um, the temporary patterns in which we have a lot of e-commerce websites, people who have peak usage, so over Christmas period, they're gonna bump up their number of servers they need by five, and then once the, everything settles back down, and they're gonna go back to normal. So I can actually combine these different growth patterns as well, and this is where the tool becomes really cool because I can design new kind of um, growth patterns to accommodate exactly what my scenario is and what my usage is gonna be. Um, we also have data transfer costs. So in, in this example, I've got a user and they're communicating to the um, hosting www site on the server. And there's 60 gigabytes of data flowing from the source to destination. And there is 360 gigabytes flowing from the destination to the source. So from my um, server to my actual users. I can also come on here and say, I, you know what, I need some support from the cloud provider, so let's take that into account. So I can say I need developer, business enterprise, all the different um, offerings from the different cloud providers. I can say what do I need in terms of support. And the new feature which was recently released is the other costs. In this deployment, I might have some other um, software that I wanna use, I might have different staff that I need be for this scenario. So I can create as many other costs as I like and attach it to my cost report and we'll see those come up. So during any time I'm designing this, I've got this C3 year cost report and that's, as soon as I click that, that's when the simulation starts to run. So it's gonna take more than, there we go, that was quite fast, nice. Um, that actually took the entire thing and ran it hour by hour, day by day, month by month, and associated what I'm gonna use and how much that's gonna cost. Including all the tiers, the usage tiers, the more I use, the cheaper it will be. All those things are, in are included in this simulation. So first thing we can see is a three-year cost report, and we see our monthly usage split by um, where my costs are actually gonna go. A couple of cool things we can see on here is the green is our data transfer. is actually growing over time. And that's because we've got a permanent pattern applied to this. We can see our server usage has got a couple of peaks. So we've got one peak here, one peak every year basically. And that's because we're using Amazon one year reserved instances. We also have a peak over um, November and December because we've designed a temporary peak for our, our usage in this scenario. Why do you have that peak every year because of the, the 
Why do we have it? Sure. Um, so a reserved instance, what happens is AWS um, is an AWS specific um, feature. And what they do is say, if you pay upfront a lump sum, we can give you a discounted hourly rate. So what happens is that at the beginning, I need to pay, make, make an upfront payment. And I'm going to get a discounted rate for the other months. And I'm actually going to um, walk you guys through uh, import as well and run an actual simulation on one of the, our own accounts and see how much money we can save. That will be really cool. Um, and the total cost breakdown. So we can see um, the majority of my costs are going towards my server running hours. Um, the questions are right now, before we've even done anything, can we optimize on those costs? Do I really need all my servers running 24 hours a day? What, how much money would I save? Is it even worth my while if I just run them 9 to 5? That's the kind of scenarios we can build. And obviously, we can clone this entire deployment. It will take an entire copy of everything. Um, and we can start to change different things about it and make a completely different scenario. So that's a basic walkthrough of Plan for Cloud. And you guys are thinking, wow, why are they offering this for free, right? Because it's awesome. Um, <laughs> so that was a walkthrough of Plan for Cloud. A couple of notes to, to kind of keep in mind at this stage of your cloud adoption. One. Your server costs are probably, depending on your application, your server costs are probably going to be between 80 to 95% of your costs. But do not look past the other costs. We actually had a, um, I, I'm based in Edinburgh, so we had a, um, one of our users based in um, England. And they said, you know what, our server costs are going to be 95% to, to nearly 100% of our costs. Um, and I said, OK, well, let's, let's do some scenarios and let's see, because your storage is going to grow over time. Let's kind of see what that looks like. And it came out as they actually had between 79 to 80% of their costs were only servers. So the, the other section was storage that they didn't even think about. So it's really easy to do that. Why not do it? Um, you pay with regard to storage. You pay for the amount of storage that you provision, not the amount of storage you use. That's something that catches people off, off guard sometimes. They provision 100 gigabytes, use a single gigabyte, and they think, oh, I've only used one, so I'm going to just pay for that little penny, right? No, you'll, you'll have to pay for the entire, thing, uh, entire 100 gigabytes. Uh, look at different regions. Different regions are priced differently, so assess the cost of different regions. Now, that might, you know, these, some of these regions might not be worth it because of latency, um, the time it takes for you to serve your customers, things like that. But if the option is open, I would definitely look at different regions. Um, pay attention to currencies. We said that before. Specific resources for specific use cases. EBS versus S3 versus Glacier, right? They're all kind of storage things, but which one should I use? We did a blog post when Glacier came out um, comparing Glacier and S3. It turns out that Glacier is about 90% cheaper than S3. Until then, we had a lot of users actually go into S3 and design archiving solutions on S3. Why not move it to Glacier? You're going to save 90% of your costs. Um, if you terminate a server with a volume attached, you are going to still be charged for that volume unless you shut that volume down as well. So the granularity is quite deep. So you can choose a lot of resources that connect together. However, if you shut down one of these resources, be mindful of everything else that you've connected to it. If you don't need them, shut them down, or else you're just going to pay for them. Um, so that was a quick walkthrough of, um, of proof of concept projects right at the beginning on analysis phase. Um, actually, straight, I believe it's straight after this one, um, VJ is doing an entire workshop on, um, well, a presentation on proof of concept projects. So if you guys want to stick around for that as well, um, that, would be, that would be really good for them. Um, and at this point, I'll introduce Ronnie on stage, and he can walk through the um, deploying and monitoring of these applications. All right. Hi, everybody. Sorry if I don't sound my best. I'm uh, not feeling particularly well. However, so deploying cost-effective infrastructure. Uh, there are many different factors, as Hassan mentioned, into uh, planning for your costs and uh, how you prepare for your infrastructure. And part of that is, involves actually deploying and some considerations that you need to go through when you're planning to uh, when you're planning to get your infrastructure up and running so first thing as Hassan mentioned before is location right so as I 
you know, real estate location is everything. Well, location also makes it also plays a huge factor in uh, designing and deploying cloud infrastructure. So Hassan mentioned it before, but a question that's a very important one to ask when deciding which location to choose for your infrastructure, be it uh, you know, in the West Coast of the United States or in uh, Southeast Asia or in Europe or wherever it may be, is why are you deploying your infrastructure to that particular location? Right? Is it because it's the cheapest location? Well, that may make sense, but are you furthest away from your, your, your users? Well, if you're far away from your users, then the costs themselves may not necessarily, the cost savings may not outweigh the degradation performance that your users will experience if you're running an application, however, uh, whatever distance they are, you are away from them. So this is something that I've experienced. My background is in, uh, is in social, mobile, and console gaming, and I'd experienced this personally where development teams would choose to co-locate resources or to host resources close to them. And close to them sometimes meant in uh, the Tokyo region, AWS Tokyo. Well, that happens to be one of the most expensive regions. And what would happen there is they would actually burn through their entire allocated development budget in a month's time. And then you're left with 11 months of the year that you need to go, they need to go sort of beg, borrow, and plead for more money from our controllers or financial analysts to allow them to spend more money. So you do need to put some thought into where you host your, where you host applications. If it's development environments, maybe you can take that latency hit and have it in a cheaper region. But if you're putting your applications, if you know where your users are, move those applications closest to them, but understand that there are cost implications to that. Uh, Multi-region hosting. So, and we we preach uh, disaster recovery, high availability. Uh, there are there's a two-day workshop about it. There's uh, presumably another session about uh, high availability or designing disaster recovery environments. But question is, if you're going with multi-region, is how are you going to do that? And can your applications actually sustain operating in two different regions? And I don't mean two different isolation regions or availability zones in the same cloud location or in the same, if using AWS as an example, in the same AWS region, so two different availability zones. I mean hosting your application in multiple regions. So you have, in a typical DR environment, you would have, let's say, a cold standby environment in US West and your live production or, operate or live ops environment in US East. Can your application actually fail over? What will it take for you to fail over your application? If your application isn't designed to really fail over well, then maybe you don't want to consider a hot standby because then you're just burning through, you're burning through more money than you'll actually need, right? So you spend some more time thinking about how your applications will fail over and whether or not you want to have a cold standby environment, a, a hot standby environment, a full a full second running environment, or the, the ultimate, right, is if you have an entirely geographically distributed application that you can actually route traffic to different locations and have usage go to the closest end users. But that is, you know, that, that is one of the, you know, that, that's the ultimate objective in, in web application design. If you can get there, that's awesome. If you can't get there, consider the costs of running different infrastructure in different environments. Well, there we go. Can you do it? Should you do it? <laughs> uh, account and deployment structures. So our, most people are right scale customers or prospects here. And so there are two thi a couple things to consider with your account structures, so your, your cloud accounts, and in the right scale world, your deployments. So with your, with your cloud provider accounts, how you structure your accounts will greatly facilitate how easily you can actually report back on your costs. So everybody's heard of rogue IT where a line of business or a business unit or whatever, somebody goes out and spends a bunch of money with, uh, with Amazon, they got their boss's credit card, and that's fine because they get something going. And in another department kind of hears of that and maybe instead of getting their boss's credit card, they get credentials from their buddy in the other department and they start running multiple applications in the same account, or it's easier to just run everything in one account because you don't have to go and submit a second expense report or whatever that may be. What you end up with is a jumbled mess of multiple applications or multiple services running out of the same account, and it is very, very difficult to start gleaning out which servers belong to which application and which environment and which region and which one is using which, 
which application has which volumes attached and which application is dependent on this remote object storage or which application is using this database as a service instance or this other one. So when putting thought into this, you gotta consider how many accounts will I need? What will that mean for being able to actually report on usage in the future? And that is reflected or paralleled in right scale as well, where we have this notion of parent account and child accounts. So we'll demonstrate shortly our report manager service, which allows you to report across uh, instance, and, instance and volume usage across multiple accounts, multiple cloud accounts and right scale accounts. How you structure your deployments and within right scale in those accounts is also quite important. You can choose a couple different ways. You can ultimately you can do whatever you want, but some of the more successful patterns that I've seen, both as a customer, which is I was a right scale customer for many years, and in product, uh, a couple different successful uh, scenarios are per business unit or line of serve line of business or per per service where you have a cloud account and a right scale account assigned to a particular entity in your organization, be it a service, a project, whatever it is, but that encapsulates all of the costs of that entity, of that thing. Another very common uh, structure is by software development lifecycle. So you have accounts, cloud provider accounts, and subsequent right scale accounts for a dev environment, a QA environment, a test, et cetera, et cetera, up to live operations. That becomes interesting, or I've seen this personally, is where this becomes really interesting is you can easily, very easily break out costs that are attributed to development versus live operations, which may not necessarily be accounted for in the same way. My background in game development, the live operations costs were considered part of an entirely different part of the business, which was publishing, and the development costs were booked to actual development studios, and they wanted no part of each other's costs. So this was a, this is a solution or a way of structuring accounts that helps uh, quite a fair bit. There are, of course, there, there are a couple of different other ways of doing it, but these are some of the more successful ways we've seen, uh, we've seen, this, we've seen this done. Uh, as Hassan mentioned, right, licensing costs. So you have different operating systems and different permutations of that. Understanding your licensing costs is very important, right? You can go into AWS and launch whatever server type you want. That's cool, you can launch Oracle servers, and if anybody's worked in large IT organizations before, you know that you can't just go and install Oracle if you choose to do so, because someone's gonna have to pay for licensing, and you can't just install whatever SQL MSSQL server version you want, because your IT department needs to allow you to use a certain version. You can't just install a data center version of Windows Server if you want to. However, through most providers, go ahead, do whatever you want. However, you will end up with paying, as an IT organization will, you will end up paying for running Red Hat Enterprise Linux or SUSE Enterprise Linux or Oracle database servers, which are not cheap, or uh, any type of MSSQL server. So this is something that is sometimes forgotten. I've experienced this, again, firsthand with some of our customers at RightScale, uh, where you're not necessarily cognizant of it. It's like, I needed a MSSQL server, so I chose that one. Well, that one costs $7 an hour, right? That other one costs a dollar an hour, or have you considered perhaps using MySQL, right? If, it's, if you just need a relational database, consider the, consider the licensing costs. Lastly, auto scale, right? So we're the, we're the scaling company, we do it great. Um, aside from automated scaling up and down, what you do need to consider is how, if, you're, if your application has uh, you know, defined life, a lifespan, you do need to consider how you're going to downscale your applications. How are you going to back out or minimize your footprint at the right time? And that comes, part of that includes looking at optimizing your infrastructure, monitoring your costs effectively so that you know based on the performance of your service, the performance of your infrastructure, and the cost of your applications, when should you start downscaling to maintain a good performance to price ratio. So on that note, I'm gonna go into uh, a demo of how some of the tools that we have in RightScale, excuse me, to, uh, to monitor costs. So the two things, uh, this is a, well, not the right version of the deck that I was gonna show. Uh, it's supposed to be shorter than this. So um, let me pop into, excuse me, the RightScale dashboard, which I hope I'm still logged in. Uh, 
All right, so uh, hold on a second. Can you still be logged in as Hassan? Excellent, excellent. All right, so the first thing that I just want to quickly show everybody is a quick glance at, uh, at, monitoring, your at monitoring your costs um, very quickly out of any account. So as you can see, we have a bunch of accounts. These are all our uh, sales demo accounts. And a very valuable tool right on the front page when you log into the Red Scale is uh, this deployment budget estimate widget, which is a roll-up of the current run rate, month to date, projected costs, and the prior month costs, as well as the state of all of the servers in the deployments that exist within a given account. So if this was an account for a line of business or a service, you would have dev, prod, QA, et cetera, and at a glance you could see what is the current run rate. can go and spin up instances and they will appear in here if they do spin them up and you should be able to very quickly get an understanding of is infrastructure running or not. Uh, now we're going to jump back into, as I mentioned, so have this uh, construct of enterprise parent accounts and child accounts hierarchy. So now I'm switching back into the parent account of our sales demo or technical sales uh, demo account. So this is uh, this is our report manager service. So what this does is this allows you to generate reports based on the instance and volume usage across multiple clouds. All of your accounts uh, allows you to apply a certain number of filters and filter filter by uh, by record type or by by header type and also by metadata. Yes. Yes. Uh, it'll, what you'll see is the instance type. Uh, it, won't sh it won't show you the specs of an instance, if that is the, if I understood the question correctly. Well, the specs and whether it's considered a small, medium, large, extra large deployment of that server. Uh, well, you'll see, the, you'll see the instance type, right? But you won't see, well, s s we can take the question offline, but small, medium, large uh, deployment type is a bit, it's subjective and it's to, it's each environment or each organization may have a different perception of what a small or large deployment is. Uh, what you will see, and I'll show you in a moment, is you can slice and dice the information however you see fit and whatever fits your organization. So you can view, you can visualize the data to have uh, all, to see all of the deployments across all of your accounts and all of the all of the the resources that are that consist of that deployment, and from there you can draw your to an extent you could draw your own conclusions of this is a large deployment or this is a small deployment. Um, we can we can also uh, yeah, we can we can take the question a little further offline if we want to dig into it further. So uh, very quick, I want to get through this quickly. Um, I'm not going to go through the process of creating a report. It's fairly, it's fairly straightforward, but I will show you very quickly what the, sort of what the screen lo does look like, right? So you're able to uh, select the different, the different report type that you want to create. You can assign metadata, so you can, go, uh, you can go and tag accounts, deployments, and servers across multiple accounts, multiple clouds, et cetera, and report on that metadata, or just report on the actual deployment name, the server name. So you could say, uh, find me everything called Bob's deployments, and then that will generate a report. Based on these different, you can, uh, you can choose whichever headers you want here, and they're different by, they're different by instance type. Uh, whoops, not where I meant to go. All right. As well, you can also choose to, you can, you can output this data by, to email at whatever interval you want, daily, weekly, monthly, uh, and you could go back to I believe it's last August when we created this report service and started uh, to expose this aggregated data. So you can report back until uh, August. So I'm going to show you a couple different examples of 
this is what the data actually looks like. So you get a large, you get a large uh, uh, CSV file with a ton of different data, provider, cloud deployment name, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how long the server's been running for, and here we see the, the instance type, right? So is it a small, a large, medium, et cetera? The platform, uh, the pricing type, so shortly in the next release we'll start seeing uh, breaking out granularly on-demand reserved rates and spot rates, as well as the cost and the right-scale compute units consumed. So what did this server cost entirely? Now, this is cool, but it's just a bunch of data. And unless you're a data geek, it's not that much fun. How many servers do I have running in each deployment, right? And this is where you could kind of come to the, to, the, to the conclusion that this is a large deployment, a small deployment, or whatever it is based on whatever's running in there. This is okay, it gives you a quick glance at that data, but well, what if you want to see it a little bit differently? What does each, what is each, inv what is each deployment cost me over the course of whatever period of time I've ran this report on? Is it a month to day report? Is it, uh, what was the, what was the cost of my development environment from five and a half months ago? Well, I can go and run that report whenever I want, if we're being audited, or if you need to start reporting some more details back. This is, this is one interesting view. Another way of looking at the data, which is also quite compelling, is this. So you can look at it by, this is all of the, this is all of the usage in all of our sales demo accounts, right? So this is, our, our, our pre-sales guys and girls, they go out and they use these accounts, they create demos and so on. Well, what do they each cost? Well, we can look at this AWS demo account. We can say, well, it costs this much. This is the same information. As you dr dig in a little bit further, you can see, well, Dean's daily blog, he's running not very much. He's got his, uh, his WordPress trial in there. That's okay. We could look at some of the other ones and we could start seeing, well, this... Uh, this one down here, this is NPHP environment, what are all the different servers? Well, this represents an actual three-tier stack. We can go a little bit further with it, and this is where it becomes a little more interesting as far as accountability goes, and we could start seeing, well, who provisioned what? Actually, that's not where I wanted it. I want it up here. We can see who provisioned what. So we can see uh, provisioned by. Uh, uh, provisioned by, we don't want unknown. Well, we can see that uh, you know, our different, our different uh, technical pre-sales guys, they're, they're, they're doing stuff, they're, they're creating demos, they're, you know, they're, they're racking up some costs and they're you know, bringing in the sales that go along with it. But the point of this is that depending on how you choose to visualize the data, you can allocate costs to uh, different services, lines of business, development teams, or you can even go so far as to understand what do individuals cost in cloud consumption, which is crazy hard to do in a typical in a typical infrastructure environment. Yes. So in this example, are, are all of these users running off the same AWS account, or do they each have unique ones that you're rolling up the reporting? In this case, it's an, in this case it's uh, a unique AWS account, which is this one. Uh, can, Yes. So then each person has a unique login, it's the right scale, and that's how you identify Correct. That is correct. Now, because this report, this data that we're looking at is the data across about, I think, a dozen or so right scale accounts with a dozen or so distinct credentials, and I don't mean for this to be a uh, how to use Excel uh, <laughs> demo on how to use Excel, uh, but what we can also easily do is then move the data around a little bit differently and see um, you know, what is Matthew doing across all of these different accounts. Right? So Matthew's using these, different, these, these five different accounts and he's got infrastructure running all across them. So what does Matthew cost the organization in general? Uh, so that's what this is meant to demonstrate, is how you can visualize data differently. Um, I wish this existed when I was a customer of RightScales 
because I had to build a lot of these reports manually or harass Sean, who is my account manager, to produce this data. And I can also definitely say that I wished something like Plan for Cloud existed when I was a customer, so I would have been able to forecast my costs with a lot more accuracy. So on that note, I'll pass it back to Hassan, and we'll continue. Great, thanks. Um, I'm aware that we only have like five minutes. Um, so I'm going to quickly jump in and uh, show you guys some of the cost optimizations that we can start to um, we can start to make. So in Plan for Cloud, we have so once you've sliced and diced your data, you've understand your your costs in the Plan for Cloud dashboard. You don't actually need to make an entirely new deployment. What you can do is actually click Import. Currently, we only offer import from AWS or um, RightScale. So you can enter your username and password. We will go there, get a snapshot of everything you're using, and bring it in ready for you guys to make future forecasts. So I've actually done this with one of our, um, one of our scenarios. It takes a little while for it to come in. So in here, we have our RS demo, AWS Elastic um, Web demo, plus the disaster recovery. We've got about nine small instances um, on US East and one small on US West. So as I said, reserve instances, you pay an upfront cost and you get a lower discount uh, an hourly cost. So in this deployment, over three years, this will deployment cost us $16,000, okay? So let's see what would happen if, if I change the purchase option. So up here, I can click change purchase option and I'm gonna change everything to a, let's say a one year heavy utilization. That means I'm gonna use this thing to the maximum of I can and I see how much it's gonna cost me. So that's going to rerun the simulation, and immediately what we can see is we've bumped up from about $400 for the per month cost to one upfront payment per year of about $1,800 and a much, much lower monthly cost. Remember, it was £16,000 for the three years. Immediately, I've gone down to $9,000 by using one-year heavy utilization. That's... I've saved £7,000 right off, off the bat for that, for that scenario. Now, that might not be the exact number that you would want to buy, but this is the kind of thing this software can enable you to do. Um, we can also try it out with three-year, right? We can buy everything on a three-year heavy utilization and see what that would do. Again, that has a much, much bigger upfront cost and a much lower um, monthly hourly cost. So it's, it's going to cost us 2600 2700 but a much lower monthly cost, and we've gone down to about 6,000. We've reduced our spend by 10,000 over the three years. And you can come pay me later, that's okay. But, <laughs> but this, this kind of lets you do that kind of scenario building to say, go to your finance department and say, this is how much money we can save if we do things properly. So there's a lot of cost optimizations that we could make, um, and it will save us a lot. The difference being that trade-off. If we, as, a, as right scale, in fact, we have a lot of these instances running as you saw. If we were to buy everything upfront, three-year cost, that initial spike will take our cash flow right out. That will kind of, you know, will make that life very, very hard. So what the different, what the way off is, the upfront might be, st you, you might be able to buy 10 now, 10 in three months time and so on. So you can stagger that purchasing and see how that would look in terms of monthly costs and your cost breakdowns. Um, so actually we've got, I guess we've overrun, um, but I've got a couple of minutes. So we can take um, any kind of questions that you guys have on specific use cases that you, you have for your, um, for your deployments. Any questions? Go for it, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, what about possible support for Amazon spot pricing? Mm. So, yeah, um, so Amazon spot pricing is the, um, at any one point, Amazon will have a lot of resources kind of n unused, and they will give a spot price, um, which may be cheaper um, or more expensive than on demand, um, so it might make it more worthwhile to use those. Currently, we don't support them, because they constantly change and they change over historic periods of time as well, depending on how much hardware Amazon has put in place for a certain, um, for a certain region and things like that. But it would be interesting to have your use case as well. We can chat that off offline about on, that. Um, on the right scale, so, oh, 
through the through the Red Scale dashboard. If you if you launch uh, spot spot instances through the report manager, we will identify through the AWS APIs which price you're paying, and those that price will be reflected in the through the report manager data. It's, it is very difficult to forecast it given the fluctuation, though. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm going to pass around my business card as well, so come, uh, come catch me afterwards. I'm here. All, um, we're both actually here tomorrow as well. Yes. Um, so any kind of questions or you want us to look at your specific scenarios, we can go through those as well. Um, so my name is Hassan. Ronnie, give us a shout, and we can cover your questions. Thank you. Thank you.